Um, welcome, everybody, everyone who's both here in person and people who are uh, coming online live streaming. It's really an uh, exciting time for all of us to be uh, kicking off this particular series of lectures here at Green College. Why? Because we've been in exile uh, for 18 months. And uh, although this session's all about intergenerational trauma, my ancestors are going to be reverberating about how much I really hated being in the lockdown for 18 months. So their, their genes will have been altered. Anyhow, uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, people who organized this. I want to acknowledge the principal of the college here. It's Mark Vesey. He's with us and he's hosting us. Uh, and also, I want to uh, thank Graham Wynn, who is the uh, former principal, the last year's principal of the uh, Professors Emeritus uh, College. So this is a this uh, adventure that we're on is a joint project between Green College and the Emeritus College. Uh, first, I want to say we do recognize that we're on the uh, traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam people and this territory. This event, as you know, and you signed up for it, is called the Senior Scholars Series, uh, and defined as intergenerational effects of, uh, of psychological trauma. The conveners of this uh, are, it's a team. There's three of us from the Emeritus College, and one of them is my colleague here, I'm Professor Judith Hall, and the other one is he's going to be on Zoom joining us from off-site. It's Richard Vedan, and myself, I am the coordinator of the team. So just to put this in context why we're doing this. We're doing this because trauma is getting a lot of attention in our, in our societies around the world and here in a number of different levels and there are lasting or lingering effects to some extent which we're discovering and there are approaches to how you can reduce the impact of intergenerational trauma across a number of different populations. So in the seven months, there are going to be seven presentations of different sectors of society that we are focusing on to the degree that the impact of the environment does modify um, the lived experience first, second, third generation, and Judith and our visiting professor from McGill, who's in virtual, will explain that. So the presentations of the series will reflect, a, uh, will reflect a broad range of populations and social cultural contexts, which a traumatic injury is intergenerationally transmitted to its descendants, as I said. That is, the descendants of the people originally injured. In the work that I do with a military, we refer to uh, a trauma. We refer to this as a trauma injury. And injuries do heal, and injuries can be repaired. So we tend to use that particular term. And many of us are the inheritors of people who've gone before who had these kind of injuries. It's part of the human condition. The aim of the series is to make a broad comparison of cases and perspectives from different settings so that researchers can learn from each other and discover what kinds of support systems are most likely to help recovery and restore resilience for all of those that are affected. So this isn't a series just looking at the research and the impact of intergenerational trauma. It's that plus what are some very particular approaches that help ameliorate these conditions in each session, each month. The presenters will talk about their work in areas to assist people who have these kind of injuries. And you know, it's every, I think it's every, Tuesday, every third Tuesday of every month over the next seven months, we'll be meeting and hopefully, if the COVID, uh, what is it, Delta virus um, behaves and calms down and disappears, we may be all together here in person in this building. But for now, it's a hybrid approach. So I'm now going to ask uh, my colleague here, Judith, to take it from here uh, in terms of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Am I OK? So um, this is a series, and this is the introduction to the series. 
And as Marv said, it's really about intergenerational effects. And until recently, we didn't understand those actually have a basis in physiology. And that's part of what's so exciting, because if we can understand it, then we may be, be even better at treating it. This is definitely a team effort between the three of us. And I'm the geneticist. So theoretically, I understand what's happening on that molecular level. And that's what I hope to share with you. So it is a series on nature nurture. In other words, the genetic part and the environmental part. And together, they shape not only who we are, but the next generations as well. And that's the part that's just really intriguing. From my perspective as a geneticist, this is part of evolution. Evolution is very clever. It's survival of the fittest. And so if, in fact, you can send on to your children some information that may help them survive, that's what this is about. And again, this is the introduction, so it's a little bit more technical in terms of what's happening on a DNA level. Um, but it's meant to lay the groundwork for what will come afterwards. Last spring at the CURAC, the Canadian University Retirees Association, was hosted by McGill. And they had a series of talks, and one of them just blew me away because it was by an expert in epigenetics. And so because he did such a beautiful job, what we're really doing is presenting his video with the questions that happened, and then we'll open it for your questions. So epigenetics means on top of genetics. And on a biochemical level, it's the things that affect the DNA as to whether it, it expresses or not. Because in your cells, every cell in your body has the same DNA, but you don't express most of it because it's expressed in a tissue-specific, time and development specific, sex specific way. And the more we learn about it, the more complicated it is. But the real question has been for geneticists, what controls the genes? Who turns them on? And that's what this is about. It turns out at the beginning of a gene, there's a section. It's kind of its control switch. And Moshe will um, describe that. So Moshe Ziv is who's on the video. He's a pharmacologist, geneticist, and he's worked with Michael Meany, who's done a lot of this work. So just a little historical perspective. In the year 2000, for the first time, we began to understand how many genes human beings had. Now, 20,000 may sound like a lot, but they make 200,000 plus proteins. So one gene can make many proteins. And again, who controls that? So that's what this whole new epigenetics is about, is telling a gene when to turn on and what tissue, but also what parts of it to express. And Moshe will describe that for you. The surprise was only 2% of all of our DNA, the six miles of it, all of our DNA actually is genes. So to begin with, people thought the rest is junk. It's not just junk. It's very complex control mechanisms. And I think it's fair to say we really don't understand all of that really yet. But what we have come to understand is the genes lay in pathways. So this one turns on this one, turns on this one. And there aren't that many pathways. So the good news as we begin to understand things is that if we can understand that pathway, then we may be able to figure out how to alter things and treat a variety of disorders. So the, the, as Moshe will explain, the genes are made up of exons and introns, and you cut out the little introns, but you use different sort of matches of the exons, and he'll come to that. Now, at the same time, in the year 2000, there, a guy named Barker in England was beginning to recognize the developmental origins of adult health and disease, DOHA. We're actually having the International Congress here next summer. But 
that whole area is that things during your development determine your health. And Barker was looking at men with heart attacks that got their heart attacks before the age of 40. And he recognized that they were all from low social economic. And when he went back to their records, they were all small babies. So he figured out that it had to do with their diet. And he hypothesized that what their mother ate during the pregnancy with this man actually determined that he would get heart disease. Well, it's kind of true, and it's, lots has happened since then. But what's really been recognized is there are three things that are very much determined by the pregnancy. One of them has to do with your metabolic outcome. If you're a small baby when you're born, you um, are programmed for starvation. So you're expecting the world to be a, a world where there's little food. Now, unfortunately, what we do is try and fatten those kids up. And what we're doing is messing up their metabolism. And the epidemic of type 2 diabetes that is being seen in the world has to do with overfeeding those small babies. So indigenous all over the world, immigrants, refugees who fl are fleeing from starvation have small babies, and we fed them all. So I can tell you as a pediatrician, we've had to relearn you don't fatten those babies up. So the first thing that is a developmental origin of adult health is your metabolism. And if your mom was, didn't have enough food, then you will be small and programmed for being small. The second thing is stress. If your mom is under a whole lot of stress, then you're going to be hyper alert a little bit non-trusting, watching out for things. And of course, that's, a, that's definitely evolutionary good, because if she's worried, then actually, you should be worried. So the idea is that if she's under stress, it's a good thing for baby to be programmed. And, the, and it turns out that actually goes back to fish. So if either the mother fish or the father fish is ever chased by a big fish, the baby fish won't come out of the shadows. I mean, it's a good thing. You know, they'll be eaten up if they do. But the surprise is that it's not just those baby fish. It's their baby fish and their baby. These are three generation, maybe four and five generation effects. So in evolution, this was probably good because you know, the, the starvation or the predators were around for more than one generation. But today can be a problem. The third thing that is multi-generational is your microbiome. You've probably heard about all the bugs that live on your body and in your gut. And they make all kinds of compounds that affect your metabolism, your psychological response, all kinds of other things. So all three of those are more than one generation. Three at last count, but they're looking like in animal studies, five and six generational effects, which in the course of evolution allowed survival. But today, it's something of a problem. So I think with that background, what we'll do is go ahead and listen to Moshe and listen to the questions that were asked, because they're actually really good questions that expand the whole area. And then I will welcome your questions and hope I can answer them. So, Alan, we can go ahead. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, uh, Principal, for uh, an inspiring introduction, message for the vision, and thank you for your nice words that you said about me and for setting up the uh, question that I'm going to discuss with you uh, uh, this afternoon. Nature and nurture has been on our minds probably still since we were walking on this planet. What is more important, the biological matrix that we are born with or the stuff that happens to us during life, our parents, our environment, uh, our friends, our society? In modern terms, nature is genetics. 
it's the genes that we inherit from our ancestors, genes that evolved in uh, billions of years of evolution. How, determine, how determinant they are in defining our phenotype. Are they doing everything or leaving something for that ephemeral nurture? And if indeed nurture has any role, how does it play its role? Is it magic? Or are there real biochemical processes that mediate between the love and care of a mother and the way this baby will develop uh, later in life? The environment that this baby is going to grow in, physical, social, economic environment. And the answer to this centuries or millennia old questions became possible with the evolution of the field of epigenetics. For the last 50 years, we understood that we have the same DNA in every cell. So when we inherit the DNA from father and mother, the same identical DNA will be in the billions of cells that will make up our body. But we know that every part of our body does different things. So how can same DNA perform different programs in different cells and parts of the body? And this question was answered even before we understood how DNA works. And the person who actually addressed this question was Waddington in the United Kingdom. And he's the one who coined the term epigenetics. That is something beyond genetics must be happening uh, to DNA that allows it to perform all its different functions. And to simplify and use a metaphor, what does epigenetic mean? And I think we all use cell phones and computers. And we understand that any computer is composed of multiple parts. The most important part, of course, is the hardware. In our computer, it's the DNA itself, the chemistry of the DNA. It's the wires, the leads, the circuitries. On this hardware, we have an operating system. Could be Windows, could be Apple. And the sequence, the genetics, is our operating system. However, we also need software because like any good phone or computer, we have different apps. And if you think about our body, one app is a lung and another one is a heart and another one is a liver. So somebody has to write on the sequence on the operating system software. And we can think about epigenetics or DNA methylation, which is the aspect of epigenetics I will discuss in detail as the software. So we have computers in our body the same operating system everywhere, but different apps make cells perform specific tasks in space and time. The amazing thing about humans and other organisms is that, that our DNA doesn't just define how we look when we are born, it has to program our entire life. And so it has to perform specific tasks at specific places, but also at specific times. So if we understand the way our DNA works like this, then what is disease? Disease is caused by changes in the app that we could map and use, for example, for early detection. So it's just little chemistry, um, although I apologize for being uh, too uh, specific here, but it's so beautiful that I need to share it with everyone, even those of you who are not in chemistry or biochemistry. So one of the letters of our DNA is cytosine. We have four letters. This letter could be modified by proteins, specific proteins called enzymes, DNA methyltransferase, that take a methyl group from a dietary supplement called S-adenosylmethionine and position it on this position in DNA. And this creates an amazingly simple and complex at the same time way of programming DNA because this cytosine would allow gene to be an on and this marking will shut it down. So you have almost a binary system like the coder of a computer a software program and you can decide which gene uh, is going to work and which is not going to work. So if we have 20,000 genes and multiple ways of um, starting those genes, we have an immense a complexity that one can create. And this is exactly what happens um, during, um, uh, during uh, embryogenesis. 
In the last years, we'll learn that this gets even more sophisticated and more beautiful because this methyl group could be further modified by other enzymes that we call in chemistry oxidize the methyl group to different level of oxidation. And again, adjust this signal to uh, multiple other signals. So on one cytosine, you can have multiple forms of way this gene is work. And now without knowing the details, you can understand how you how during embryogenesis, an enormous level of plasticity is created. And we need to think about um, these systems as networks. So it's not which gene works and not, it's which groups, which networks of genes work together or not. Some are active, some are inactive. And when that network works, we get a heart and this network works, get, we, we get a lung and so on and so forth. These of course are processes that are deeply uh, determined by evolution and, and define uh, in a very predictable way uh, how an organism like ourselves uh, develops. But now this has taught us one important lesson that leads us to addressing the question, how could nurture change nature? What we'll learn from epigenetics is that DNA doesn't need to be changed to perform numerous tasks. DNA methylation adds to DNA a cellular identity. If I take a piece of DNA today, I can map exactly the methylation sequence, and I know if it comes from a liver or a heart or even which neuron in the, in the, in the brain it comes from. This is kind of very stable, very fixed. However, it tells us that the same DNA could do different things. So perhaps ba a baby can inherit the same DNA like another baby, but if that DNA is modified differently, not just by embryogenesis, but by experience. So perhaps DNA has an experiential identity. Perhaps there is a way by which environment can talk to DNA and, and methylate it in a different way, change the chromatin in a different way, and thus change the phenotype. And really the breakthrough came from a meeting that I had with another great scientist at McGill, uh, Michael Meany. And Michael Meany, spend his life in an understanding uh, impact uh, of early life on how humans and animals develop. And he used this beautiful model where you see a rat uh, taking care of her pups. And the licking and grooming uh, of the pups uh, define how these pups will develop. Some rats do a lot, some do very little, most of them do something in between. And when Michael and his team separated these rats and followed them until they became adults long after their mother was dead, he found that there are big differences between the rats that received a lot of care and those that received little care and how they develop their stress responses. So the, the rats that had a low licking and grooming mother, low maternal care developed a very stress stress response, very heightened stress response, whereas the animals that had high licking and grooming developed a very tampered uh, stress response. So Michael did another experiment which was very critical to tease apart whether these changes are caused by nurture, the way the mother uh, treats the, uh, the pups, or by nature. And, and the way they did that is by an experiment cross, called cross-fostering. So you can get the pup pup from a low mother or a high mother and split it to two mothers. One is a high and one is low. And ask the question, who will define this stressed phenotype? Is it the biological mother or is it the adoptive mother? And the amazing answer was that it was the adoptive mother, not the biological mother. It was the nurturing mother that defined the phenotype. And that raised, of course, the question, how is it possible? As scientists, we don't believe in magic. Uh, we try to find scientific explanations uh, to this uh, phenomenon. And we met each other uh, in a bar in Madrid on days where you met people not on Zoom, but drinking beer together. And uh, we discussed this. And at the same time, I was 
deeply involved in understanding how DNA methylation is changing in cancer. And this meeting of minds created a partnership to start and examine whether the same processes that define how different cells can have the same DNA and do different things is also involved, how people with different experiences will eventually do uh, have a different phenotypes. And in a work that took a decade, uh, we started charting a pathway from the behavior of the mother down to the DNA itself that ends up in differential marking of the DNA without changing the sequence. So there's when an animal, when when an animal or human mother uh, uh, takes care of the pups, there's pathways induced in the brain, like the serotonergic pathway, which in the hippocampus plays a very important role in guiding the gene, for example, of glucocorticoid receptor, uh, which will eventually control the stress response in the animal. So as the animal grooms the uh, pup, the DNA is also groomed through this signaling pathway, sending proteins to DNA that alter the way DNA is modified. So we found a proof of principle, how a grooming of a mother, which sounds like very ephemeral, can end up in very clear chemical marks on DNA at very particular addresses in the genome. But what makes this uniquely different and extremely optimistic in difference from genetics, you know, when you inherit a bad gene, it's very, very difficult to do anything about it. But this is an enzymatic reaction. We as pharmacologists know that we can tilt them to one or other side. So we actually tested that. Could we change the phenotype of an animal from a low animal to a high animal by treating it with a epigenetic drug that activates genes? Or could we reverse it the other way by an epigenetic drug? Um, this is actually amino acid that activates the methylation pathway to methylate and silence gene. And indeed, it is possible. So here we have all the principles of epigenetics. It could be modulated by environment. There are pathways leading from the behavior to the gene. Even though it's extremely stable, this methyl connection to DNA is the most stable bond in nature. Nevertheless, it's reversible and offering op opportunities both for prediction uh, and for a treatment. We were wondering if the same happens in humans. Humans are much more difficult to address. When I was a graduate student, I was told never to research humans because they are too complicated. And what complicates this kind of research in humans is teasing apart genetics from epigenetics. People might have different maternal care, not because of epigenetics, but because they have mothers have different genes that they inherited from their ancestors. So how do you tease it apart? And you can't do experiments uh, on humans, you know, like you do uh, on, on, uh, on rats. And so we took advantage of another great um, study that was, was done in, in, in Montreal by a colleague of mine, Suzanne King at the Douglas Institute. We all remember the Quebec ice storm of 1998 and the devastation it wreaked on our province. But just think about being a pregnant mother during that time and the kind of stressors that you uh, were exposed to. And is that's exactly what Suzanne King uh, was thinking about when, when the storm hit. And she started uh, following up mothers who were uh, subjected to different levels of stress during the ice storm. She cataloged this and uh, created a classifier, which she called Storm 32. And now we had an, almost a random quasi-experimental situation in humans where different stress in childhood happened. And she followed these children as they grew. And they were, they, she discovered many genetic, dif many uh, phenotypic differences between the children. For example, different levels of sugar tolerance, metabolism was altered, um, higher rates of asthma and autism. So both the immune system seems to be reacting the metabolic system and the, uh, the neural system. So we wanted to map DNA methylation when these, in these kids when they were 14 years old. And uh, we looked at the immune system because, of course, these were living in uh, healthy kids. Um, and so blood was the only available source. And we wanted to ask, can we see at 15 years, 14, 15 years, the impact of the stress of the mother? 
what we see here is the level of stress of the mother, the objective stress as Suzanne King has classified. Each column here is a different adolescent. And the color that you see here, each line here is a different gene. Red genes are methylated and you see as the stress of the mother goes high, these genes become less methylated in green. These green genes become red as the stress goes high. What you see here again, it's not one or two genes that are changing, it's an entire network. It's not necessarily changing one way, but they're changing in multiple different ways. I think about the genome as a corporation. So when a corporation decides to change strategy, it's not like one official who's going to change what they're doing. Many, many officials will change what they're doing. Many divisions will change. And this is exactly what happened. When the stress increases, the body recognizes, I need to prepare myself to a different kind of world. And the whole genome is kind of uh, marking itself in a different way. But we can also develop what we call polygenic score, DNA methylation scores, not just one gene, but we can look at multiple genes methylation and see if they can predict or tell us something about the stress of the mother. And indeed, when we looked at it, the methylation in the children can be a uh, informative on the level of stress uh, that the mother had during pregnancy. We believe that markers like this eventually will be very useful tools in the field of psychiatry by offering uh, objective measurements uh, of early life uh, stress. So essentially, uh, we think about disease as a change in the epigenetic software that programs the cell. Because uh, if, if the normal situation is like this, there are met methylation epigenetic changes, now different genes are on and off uh, causing disease. And the question is, if we can program genes, can we deprogram them? And I showed you that in the case of maternal care, we could do this. But can we use it for more medical uh, conditions, important medical conditions? And one example I'll give you is cocaine addiction, which is a horrible situation that creates a stable phenotype of craving and addiction that is highly morbid and, and devastating to the individual and to society. And I'll bring you this as just one example of how we think about epigenetics in the context uh, of treatment and intervention. So the question we asked was perhaps what happens in the addicted people as this normal state of epigenetics is changed by the experience of being exposed to a drug and creating an addicted state of expression. Can we reverse it by using uh, epigenetic drugs back to normal? The traction in epigenetic approaches is that we are kind of solving the underlying changes. We're not dealing with symptoms of addiction. We're dealing with a fundamental genomic change that is driving it. And if we can reverse it, we should be able to kind of cure the person, not just treat him, uh, him or her symptomatically. So we kind of explore that uh, possibility. The other thing we learned from epigenetics that behavioral intervention might be as important as chemical intervention, because the maternal care was a behavioral intervention, but it actually changed the chemistry uh, of, of the DNA. So theoretically, there shouldn't be a difference between a good behavioral intervention or a good therapeutic intervention or a good nutritional intervention. They all actually are hitting pathways that can lead to epigenetic reprogramming. So a friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Israel at the University of Ramat Gan, a bar Ilan in Ramat Gan, has been developing this model where a rat is learning how to self-administer cocaine. She actually connects it with a cue, very similar to humans, who usually will connect uh, certain uh, pleasurable ex experiences with, with another experience that they experienced while they did that. And these rats learn how to uh, how to self-administer and rats enjoy it. So uh, not only humans, but also rats enjoy cocaine. And after a while, we put this rat in a rehab facility. We put it, the rat in a cage without cocaine for a month, which is a long time in a rat's life. During this time, the rat can think about cocaine, but never sees cocaine and, and leads a normal life. And after a month, the rat is exposed to this light, which reminds evokes in the in the rats the memory of the great party where it received the cocaine and it starts pressing the lever 
And what's amazing is that after rehab, these rats become much more addicted than they were after the first exposure to cocaine. So we asked several questions. We found that big epigenetic changes occur in the brain of the rat during the rehab period. And also uh, big epigenetic changes occur when the cure is exposed. Now we asked the question, could we treat this rat with an epigenetic drug? This is a DNA methylation inhibitor at day 30, just as it comes out of rehab, when we stimulate the rat to uh, take uh, cocaine by the light, we treat it with this inhibitor. And what we found that it dramatically reduced the craving of the rat, which is measured by the times it presses the lever. But what's more interesting, even though we, don't, we didn't treat the rat any further, at day 60, the rat was still not addicted because we have removed some underlying genomic uh, epigenetic marks that essentially eliminated the cause uh, of the behavior. And lastly, I want to talk about aging, which fits very nicely into this uh, our understanding. Aging is a process that involves timed epigenetic reprogramming. The biological clock is affected by life history. So we all have a clock and that clock appears to be connected with DNA methylation. So we have certain genes when you're born, they have zero methylation. And when one dies, they have 100% methylation. And if you're 100 years old, it probably will move at the rate of one a few percent a year. But in some people, the biological clock moves fast. And in other people, it moves slow. So the big question now in the field is, could personal intervention to slow down the DNA methylation clock and biological aging uh, shift uh, aging? Animal evidence shows that personalized intervention could slow down the DNA methylation clock and biological aging. And sometimes we can even double the life of an animal by epigenetic interventions. Preliminary human clinical data shows that DNA methylation clock could be reversed in humans as well. So how do we translate this information in order to take control of our lives, which is the great question that we are asking now that we understand how critical is our lifestyle and what we're doing uh, for moving our life, including our methylation clock. So essentially, epi, a field of epi aging is trying to harness the power of epigenome for epi, e healthy aging by using this methylation as kind of a clock that tells us where we are in, in this life trajectory. And this is just an example of how a DNA methylation correlates with biological age. So this is the results of a clock in a few 700 people. And what you see here, each person here uh, has a the level of, bio, of epigenetic clock, a DNA methylation clock that fits its chronological age. But most of the people are somewhere along the line. But you see for this person, he's 60 year old, but his biological clock is around 90. This person is 40 years old, is 62 years old, but his methylation clock is 40. So even though most people move something around the 82 year old's lifespan, some have better clocks, faster clocks than others. So the big question in the field is, can we use this to help us to guide our life? So could lifestyle changes, exercise, dietary habits uh, that have been recommended for some time, could they actually affect the clock? And we need more data about the most advisable changes that they should, and they should be personalized because what we understand about experience, not one experience fits all. So how do we know which lifestyles uh, are advisable uh, and how, how, can we, uh, how can we learn? And I believe that it will be almost impossible to do a clinical trial that takes into account all these different matrices. And perhaps we can use another revolution that is happening in our lifetime, which is the technological revolution by which people could share those information uh, using app technologies uh, to, uh, to uh, derive. We all do experiments. Every day we do experiments with our life, but what, how do they pan out? Can we share what we did? Can we share what happened to us? Can we use DNA methylation clocks as some sort of an outcome that can tell us which combination uh, of uh, experiences are useful or not? So I'll leave you with this, uh, with this uh, figure. Uh, the idea is that perhaps we are able to change our DNA methylation uh, clock by nutrition and lifestyle changes, but we just don't know exactly how to do it. And perhaps we can learn from each other uh, by sharing and using uh, technology, in this case, 
uh, internet and, and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence technology to analyze collected data and improve the way by reinforced learning uh, that we can shift our clock a little bit and have a healthier and, and longer life. Of course, that's a dream. But finally, we have some mechanistics uh, of, of understanding how this dream might be possible one day. And I will conclude here. And I thank you very much for your attention, uh, for being with us uh, today, even though it's on Zoom. And I think I'll be open the uh, lecture for questions. Thank you, Dr. Schiff, for this most fascinating talk. We will now move on to the discussion period, which will be moderated by NTL pageant, Mura's president-elect and professor emeritus in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. Andy. Thank you very much, uh, Moshe. This was, uh, as always, a very fascinating, thought-provoking uh, presentation of something that really is growing by the bounds. And I must say, you are one of these leaders that uh, it's always fun to see what's coming around the corner. And aging said one thing that is uh, more and more interested, uh, interesting to Mura members right. who belong to that distinguished group of people that actually have to fulfill their lives when they stop working, presumably. All right, so I'm, all I could say, I'm inviting our uh, listeners to pose the questions in the on the, at the bottom of your screen, you have Q&A uh, button. You click on it and you put your question in. And if you are, while you are still thinking, uh, let me ask one question that is um, always uh, uh, intriguing in, in this context of epigenetics. And this is one that epigenetic markers are actually uh, propagating in generations. Now, how far could they go? We have these few examples uh, that you have mentioned, one recent, and I'll study it with the hunger in the Netherlands at the end mm -hmm. of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. How far this markers stay and modify uh, people's lives? So, you know, as you know, this is still a controversial Am I muted or can you hear me? I could hear you and ah, so good, good. the others should be able to hear you. Right. So this is an extremely controversial field because we believe that, you know, each generation is a carte blanche and uh, comes out uh, free from all the uh, uh, of the inheritance of uh, experience of the past. But this is probably not true. And in animals, the evidence is very strong that we can get multiple generations many generations, especially in, in lower animals like uh, nematodes or uh, certain flies. Um, but in, uh, in uh, higher animals, uh, there are many studies that are, shown, are showing fourth and fifth generation by now. And I think evolution has done this in a way that is uh, very useful for fitness. And so it's not just uh, random accidents that are happening. So certain information should be passed through future generations and others are, are, are redundant and useless. So somehow evolution has achieved the balance of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, experiences that are worthwhile preserving and those that are not. And obviously for this system to be useful, it should be erased when that information is not needed anymore. And so uh, there's going to be a balance of, uh, of inheritance and erasure and uh, and it will be fascinating to figure out how evolution uh, figured out the good formula for the balance of these two processes. And uh, however, you know, evolution is imperfect. And because of that imperfection, uh, sometimes these uh, latent experiences can cause trouble. And uh, this is what we learned from the Dutch famine study. We know that certain PTSD situations, stressful situation could be inherited not through genes, but through experience. And, um, and so the question is how much of it is useful and how much of it is detrimental. I happen to believe, and that's only a philosophical belief and not a scientific one, that uh, even disease is, teach, is, is, is an adaptive process that somehow is uh, in the wrong context. So um, in its basis, it's, it's an, an adaptive process. And, and this balance is, is very, very critical for us to understand. And of course, highly complicated. 
Well, uh, speaking of this, you, yes, you're right. In fact, uh, one of the very uh, growing branch of medicine is so-called evolutionary medicine, right. which looks, uh, we normally see patients and see the proximal causes of whatever trouble he she came to us. But in fact, there's always something that's called evolutionary tail or very uh, past. And this is where probably epigenetics is uh, very important. And it's interesting that sometimes looking at the evolutionary side of the uh, medical case, uh, we may have to we have to change the approach, therapeutic approach. For example, right. infections cause a loss of iron. And the first in, in, uh, first uh, kind of impulse is let's put this iron back. Well, bacteria like iron, and this is a fence. Well, I'm uh, waiting for somebody to say better question than- I There are many the, questions, uh, Anthony, on the sorry? chat. There are many questions on the chat. You just yes, hit the uh, Q and A. Q and A. Yeah, okay, good. So yeah. let me start. Two questions uh, from Claude Lalande. Is there any relevance of classical separated twin studies in understanding epigenetics? Yes, indeed, this is a great question. And of course, uh, twin studies have starred in epigenetics because uh, seemingly it allows us to differentiate between genes and environment. And indeed, um, very early on, uh, in early 2000s, uh, Esteller has uh, compared twins and showed that even identical twins uh, evolve many, many epigenetic changes later in life, because even identical twins are going to have a very different life uh, course. And now many diseases that are discordant in identical twins are traced to epigenetic changes from Alzheimer to asthma and others. So this is, of course, an exciting field. But however, we learned that even identical twins are not so identical, even genetically. And so uh, there are some de novo changes uh, in genetics. But of course, this is, a, this is a beautiful system to dissect it. It serves a very important role in epigenetics and especially in geno epigenomics and in mapping um, it, it changes in genetics that cause epigenetic changes versus changes that are epigenetic. And I, and I need to mention here is that a lot of genetic changes cause are in epigenetic hotspots. So the way they manifest themselves is through, is through epigenetics. And that is very important because that explains gene by environment interactions, which is two people can inherit a bad gene, but you'll see the disease only in one person. And that is because the, this is, this is only will manifest itself once the epigenetic change will happen. So the genetic change predisposes an epigenetic change that will only happen with a certain environment. And that's how uh, two, two people can inherit the same genes, but one will develop a disorder and one will not. Here's a follow-up question. Is there a, a different strength of epigenetic patterns if established in early age versus later oh, in life? Of course. And uh, um, of course, 99% of epigenetics, uh, I might be wrong because, uh, but a uh, vast majority of epigenetic changes happen through early embryogenesis. Of course, there's development after birth. We know that yeah, the brain keeps developing after birth and other tissues keep developing. And there is puberty, which is another big driver of, um, of epigenetic changes. Uh, and indeed the, the behavioral difference between males and females is driven probably to a large extent by epigenetic changes driven by hormones and, and, and et cetera. So there are multiple times in life where big epigenetic changes happen. Menopause is a big one. So, uh, you know, I just stumbled across this because I was looking at the DNA methylation patterns of breast cancer patients. And we saw this huge difference, which didn't make sense. And then I looked at the ages and there was premenopause and postmenopause and nothing to do with breast cancer. And, um, and so that's a big time. And I'm sure in, you, in males, there's also some for, so a form of menopause. And of course, aging causes huge changes in DNA methylation. And not just the normal aging, but what we call aging is when a person gets old and there are dramatic changes in epigenetics. And actually uh, animal experiments suggest that you can uh, reverse at least aging in animals by, uh, by supplementing the animal with DNA methyltransferase 3A. You can make the animal smarter and younger. 
and so um, so there are critical periods, and I think that. Um, that That's is the next question. No, which is the next <laughs> okay, so let's. Yes, uh, how do critical question. periods fit into this story? Yes, so um, so of course we have the story of embry embryonal epigenetic pattern evolution is a very timed process. So, um, you know, change number two has to happen after change number one, which happens after change zero. So it's a movie. And if you, uh, you know, you move the script very early on, the whole movie is going to change. So of course, a script that happens in the beginning of the movie will have a much larger impact on how the story evolves than a script that happens later happens later. And this is what makes it really difficult to change things when you're old or when, when the system has been closed down, because now you have uh, millions or billions of changes that have to be reversed in a certain order backwards. And although it's not theoretically impossible, it's probably practically impossible. And that's why if the changes happen early, uh, they could be more meaningful and also uh, more potent than changes that happen late. Thank you. Now, here is a, a question from uh, John David Stewart. Uh, relation of telomerase and methylation in aging. Right. So, of course, um, you know, a, a, a fantastic uh, marker of aging is, is the length of telomeres, which protect our DNA and get shorter. And uh, the belief is that once they can't protect our DNA anymore, um, uh, we senesce and die. And, um, and uh, they're not absolutely correlated, but they are correlated. However, it is uh, known now by many studies that DNA methylation is a much better predictor of age than, than telomeres. So telomeres will probably differentiate between uh, time zones in aging, but not between a year uh, by year as methylation does. Uh, the uh, DNA methylation clocks really ticks in a very amazing way. And actually, when you take the methylation levels in percentage and age, it's almost a linear correlation. And so, which, which is remarkable. I still don't understand uh, how it works. Uh, we don't understand the mechanism, uh, but uh, it probably has to do with, with uh, the enzymes that methylate, like dnm 3 t 3 a which appears to be really important in, in aging. And so that enzyme has, might, might have some inbuilt a head uh, stochasticity uh, that uh, and and some you know gradual decline. dnmt 3 itself gets methylated as we age, uh, so you you have um, you have kind of a predictable, highly predictable by the way, which is interesting. You know, like you never seen a mouse that is eighty year old, right? And it's very rare to see a human that dies at two, like a mouse. And so it seems that the methylation clock is moving much faster in a mouse than in a human. So it's highly predictable by evolution. So we are born with a clock that has a certain rate. And actually that's what probably makes the difference why certain organisms live 100 years or 400 years and others live a day. And, uh, and uh, so that clock is ticking at different rates. And so it's probably very wired into our system, but we still don't understand the complete mechanism of this. Uh, thank you. Now, next question is from an anonymous attendee who is questioning the following. His question is, as more fathers take on uh, the child rearing as the primary child caregiver in society, would we see the same DNA methylation changes as you have with mother? This is a fascinating question. So by the way, I'm asked quite a lot on this. Um, especially this time and age where we're thinking about equity and degenderization of things. But, you know, so here's a balance between biological evolution of mammals and mammals are attached to mammary glands. That's why we call mammals. And the evolution of the brain that creates new ideas that were not ingrained in evolution of paternal role. So we are definitely not a monogamous animal, neither are we a paternal animal. Um, the control of children in, in may, human evolution was initially all given to, to the mammary gland carrier, which is the female. And uh, so most of our models come from there. 
Now the big question, this is a philosophical question. I'm not going to go deep into this because I don't want to get into trouble. But the question is how much respect you give to biology or to evolution and how much can we change evolution? And you raise a really interesting thing. You say, perhaps as our brain comes up with the idea that fathers also should take care of their children, uh, epigenetics is flexible enough. It's not bound uh, you know, by these strict chains of genetics so that it will be possible uh, to, um, to change epigenetically males in such a way that they will start having the same a kind of behaviors that females have. And indeed, there are animal experiments that suggest that males also develop some of these, you know, parental kind of, and we all know that it's true, parental uh, changes when we have children. Uh, oxytocin is, is suggested to be, you know, one of the hormones that is involved in it. And more people are starting to ask this question, which, which ties into really fundamental questions and in, in, in how much respect we give to so to our biological tradition and how much we can play with it uh, to move uh, to move uh, uh, forward. But we have one example from animals. We can alter actually the gender of a mouse or the behavioral features of a gender of a mouse using a DNA methylation inhibitor. So we can turn a female mouse to a male with a DNA methylation inhibitor and it starts behaving like a male. It stays a female, but behaves like a male. And, and that is totally epigenetic. So there's something in, in, in that and who, who knows, maybe those changes in human behavior and attitudes will cause persistent and, and fixed epigenetic changes. Interesting. Here's another question that is very much in line with what's going on outside of this doom. And that is, do you believe the ongoing pandemic will have serious epigenetic effects in the I think already there is data coming up and um, a lot of people are asking this question very much faster than I, I wanted to do it, but a, a lot of it was done by others and um, showing DNA methylation changes first that predict who will be, who will have severe, you know, uh, responses and, and also show that, of course, there are going to be epigenetic changes. Questions is how widespread they're going to be. Uh, how big they are going to be. Are they going to adapt us to the situation? Uh, I believe that even, uh, you know, changing your life from uh, meeting people who smell and, and breathe to a piece of glass as we're doing now uh, will have epigenetic consequences because um, we have to adjust our brain to, to this way of life. We also see some people do it better than others. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of it has to do with the epigenetic unlock that it came to to this pandemic with and 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 that they will come out of the pandemic with and i think it will be a fascinating story so we have other questions which is like the ice storm you know it will the stress of epigenetics affect uh, you know uh, those who never suffered from the coronavirus uh, before i was talking with those who actually were infected but what about those who were not infected like most of us but suffered through all the consequences of of this uh, pandemic and of course some of us suffered more than others some of us continued the regular work. Other, otherwise, were locked in their homes. Uh, you know, some of us were exposed to more danger than others. So I think there's a lot of research projects that will come up. And I have no doubt that we will get interesting questions, including what will happen with the next generation, the children that were born during this time, but also, uh, you know, what does it do to our germline? And does it change the methylation of our ovaries and sperm and so on and so forth? Fascinating. Oh, here's a question related to your mention of technology. Are there any current trials of information sharing apps such as you described? Of course. I mean, this is exactly what app, what Apple does with a watch that you buy from uh, them. And, um, and so Google and Apple and probably Amazon are already experimenting with this. And, um, and, and this is where they're going with this uh, e-health um, idea. So a lot of people, we are trying to play with this. It's a very difficult area. It has a lot of ethical issues, a lot of issues of privacy, a lot of issues of how to share without sharing, uh, you know, uh, private issues. And uh, so, you know, I think uh, it will require a lot of uh, problem solution. But in my opinion, the best clinical trial is the one we're doing every day. And the main problem with clinical trials is because we as scientists are reductionists. So we try to have a clinical trial where everything else is controlled and we're looking for one thing. 
but humans are not one thing. And so all clinical trials are really fake because they examine a situation that is artifactual. And therefore, what happens is that many times we have a, a drug that was aced in the clinical trial, even, you know, 100,000, a million people. It doesn't make difference in number because it was all controlled. Now you send it to the wild and people do other things that you didn't control. And, and, and you get start getting things happening. And it's probably true for anything that, uh, that went through clinical trial. And so clinical trials are very expensive. Uh, and uh, we do so many clinical trials every day with our lives. If we could share it in a, in a, in a scientific way that could be analyzed, uh, we, could, we could make a big change. But I think this is exactly where, where the big high tech are going, but also smaller companies are trying to, uh, to go there. So I hope that that was interesting for you. Um, it is a little scary to think about what's happening. I, I can tell you for sure they are studying the kids who, who went to school, who didn't go to school, and looking at their DNA. So there are whole groups of people who had DNA done before the pandemic, and now we'll see what happens. OK, I just want to, uh, to recognize So I think the right answer is it hasn't been looked at epigenetically. But there, as a pediatrician, I can say for sure there's a lot of concern that the kids who spend a lot of time on screen are not socializing. And since us older folks are used to being socialized, then the question is what kind of a divide it will make. Now, there's some interesting things that could be done. You all may know that in our school system in Vancouver, you test kids as the, when they're in kindergarten. You test five different skills. Their social skills, their small motor, their large motor, their verbal, and kind of their ability to learn. And they get remediation. And it makes a huge difference. So I'm not aware yet that people are um, finding a DNA pathway for it, but there are already efforts to remediate the lack of socialization that are happening in our school system. We're pretty unique in Vancouver. Um, this is work that's come out of um, the public health group. Um, and it's incredibly exciting because what happened was when they did in an experimental group, they showed that the kids stayed in school and actually got jobs. So the government's been willing to pay for screening um, throughout the province. And um, because it saves money and social services, it's really good. So I think the system is there to screen for what's the effect of um, computers and digital on kids in terms of socialization. Yes. That's the first step. Yeah. Yep. So, so it's a great question. I do know that the people at Children's Hospital and that are part of that program are very aware that, first of all, too much digital time, but second of all, the pandemic. I mean, doing all your schooling at home, 
means you learned that grade's worth of socialization. And we're leaving ourselves so you can understand. So, so theoretically, I mean, our understanding of exactly what those pathways is still so unclear that we aren't doing it properly. But theoretically, it's absolutely true. I can't remember further on, I think it's Moshe says, you know, some kids actually do better with stress. They learn better with stress, and other kids don't. I think the teachers intuitively sense that, but we don't have a way that we actually test for it yet. They're, they are definitely, and the, the right answer is we just don't understand yet. I was telling Marv that I have this theory there are 13 stages of human beings where you use an alternative to, you use the pathway, but you use alternatives because they're better for that stage. So for instance, an embryo needs to suck the oxygen out of mom, and the fetus is less good at sucking oxygen because they use a different hemoglobin. So they actually shift from which hemoglobin they use. The studies to actually see exactly which genes you're using and what the control, they just aren't, haven't been done yet. But I think theoretically, from everything we know, it will be possible. Then will we program people intentionally and control their lives? Again, Moshe points out that it's kind of a little bit of a loose system. It doesn't work quite right every time. And that's what evolution wants. Evolution wants to try out different situations in different environments, because this may work better in that environment and so on. So the right answer to your question is we don't know yet. Sounds like Frankenstein. <laughs> oh, exactly. I mean, the idea that we, instead of sending people to prison, we DNA their methylation differently. It's a little scary, actually. So as some people who've been through terrible stress come out incredibly wise and with calm. So I, I, I absolutely can't answer your question because we don't understand the differences and we, we really haven't looked yet at the methylation that much. I thought you, when you said we came from different 
areas you were going to ask whether or not there might be ethnic differences underlying our responses. And I think the right answer to that is humans have, have, are really part of the same strain, where we really are. But we have these very interesting genes from the past. 2% of our genome is Neanderthal. Thank you very much. And we used to think of Neanderthals as really kind of, well, when they've really been studied recently, it turns out, first of all, they had bigger brains than we do. And secondly, that, that they had better tools. When we were living side by side in Europe, they were smarter, had better tools, and had better art. So maybe they would have been better if they hadn't died off. And why did they die off? The genes that we have from Neanderthals are brain genes and immune genes. I mean, it's just fascinating what got preserved in that process. So uh, how I see it is, you know, we've only been around for 60,000 years. Not that much has changed. Hello? Yes. It's your turn. Richard, you saw the presentation. Do you have a comment to make having seen this now? Have you heard the question that you've heard from Grace before? It may not be about you. I don't think Mark, the sound was not good quality. Okay. You didn't hear the question? I did not. Okay, Richard, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Coach Jam, thank you. I will. I'm sitting here in uh, the unceded territory of Coastal Salish relatives from Stahaken, the top of the hill at the Swasson land that looks out over the sea. And I quite, I found uh, the presentation uh, quite fascinating, very intriguing. And I thank Judith for um, introducing this topic to us. I was uh, at um, Thinking back to it, um, of uh, work done by a Métis family doctor, uh, Dr. Jay Wartman, and his study of uh, type 2 diabetes, when he looked at uh, um, high carbohydrate um, uh, diet and the ameliorative actions when he took uh, a traditional diet to the folks, uh, Kokola people in Alert Bay and the health that improvements it had. I'm also looking, um, well, just looking at the impact of um, the contact between first you know, between uh, settlers and indigenous people, where um, food, the culture of food, the social elements of food, and was all stolen, um, and where the culture, all of the social means by which uh, individuals reduce stress was stolen and the elements that led to increased stress at all age levels was exponential and has been for generations. I, it's very, I don't want to get caught in the same looking at um, this is a, a, um, a panacea and the answer we've been looking for but it certainly is um, um, raises questions and, and identifies some factors. Uh, in fact, in, um, in earlier times, it was known uh, before contact that when a, when a mother was carrying a child that she was, uh, she was treated in a gentle way. She was uh, not, she was protected from the traumas in the community because it was understood that any, any, any experience the mother had would be would be influence would influence the baby she was carrying, and therefore the society had a a, a duty to to uh, offer protection, uh, and that has been going on for generations over hundreds hundreds of years. So um, I'm looking at it um, 
know, it was not a one-off. Stress was is not a one-off occasional event, uh, and not just in Indigenous people's lives, but people who are in, living in generational poverty. It's it's a day-to-day -day, uh, soul wound that uh, um, results in people living in um, what one socialist said, uh, living beyond anxiety. That you had so much to worry about, you did not, uh, you couldn't worry about uh, anything at all. And uh, just from a at a health level, um, the stress um, Jim had made reference to uh, the the incidence of, of cardiac adventures uh, in males. Well, uh, type two diabetes and uh, a cardiac adventure has almost become a rite of passage due to the uh, due, due to the socialization and the colonization. Cook Richard, thank you very much uh, for that. So I might just com comment because Richard talked about protecting mom. But if you think about it, the egg that made you was developing in your mom she, when she was an eight-week-old embryo in your grandma. So not only protecting mom, but you're also protecting grandchildren. And when you think about that the egg was being made when mom was carried in grandma, you can see how there can be multiple generation effect. And Moshe said, now that you really are following things, it may be five and six generation effect. So, so, Alan, are there questions? That It's, it's just so interesting to think that it goes back so far and can have so many repercussions. And of course, for the First Nations, um, people that have, are going through the trauma what we're going through now with all of the residential schools and all the Métis that are going through that same trauma. Think that it goes back so far okay. and can have so many repercussions. And then also the point about us who have come from somewhere else to this North America, escaping tragedies, and, and right up to the present days that, you know, there's refugees just a few weeks, well, still coming from, to us. It's, it's amazing that, that this is with us and will be with us. And if we can understand it better, it may help us. And I love Judy's point about this digital uh, phenomena with no empathy and reduced. Uh, this is definitely not a good thing at all. <laughs> so I might mention um, something that Moshe didn't mention about the ice storm. Turns out it, 
what mattered was not how much danger you were in, but what mother thought she was in. So if she was really worried, you know, even though she was very close to civilization and had electricity, if she was really worried, that had the biggest effect. And it turns out that dad, in the two months prior to conception, what he's going through has an effect as well. Males. Males. Yes. So it's already there. Yeah. So of course, the people around you and what else is happening it, it compounds that. And I think when you're around people that are calm or take you for a walk every day, it has a huge effect. So all the things we're learning about mental health not only will affect you, your children, and your unborn children, but I think the increased awareness because of pandemic. Now, I'm the eternal Pollyanna, but I think the pandemic has made us in our face about so many things. And if we can now work with those, it will make a huge difference. speaking so he can hear you but we can't hear him. Uh, uh, Richard, can you hear me? I can hear you, Marv. Uh, Richard, uh, did you hear Nancy's comment? She's just referring to the fact that in indigenous history and heritage, the mother with the baby was protected, if I understood you right, you're correctly. And th what I think is very valuable in this, in your comment, is how many earlier pre-existing cultural traditions in many different communities in the world have been absorbed and forgotten in the, in the Western world we're in now, which has a kind of homogenous culture. So I think your, your comment, Richard, when you do your presentation, Richard's gonna do a presentation as well, to be very helpful of what we can learn from, in terms of this topic of epigenetic influence, about what indigenous people in the heritage can teach us around this particular issue. So I want to just acknowledge that. I will say, uh, the, what was the name of the woman, Nancy, that left? Judy. Judy. Uh, Shelley. Shelley. Sh Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl, gave, Cheryl got my attention this way, is I work in the area of more psychotherapy and trauma recovery, and it's with veterans who are injured. And the program for rehabilitation, actually, there's medications, you talked about EMDR, there's all kind of therapeutics, but the research that we're finding, actually, the, the biggest variance of change and calming of the system, and now I'm realizing maybe some kind of shift in the melanation, did, doesn't come just from that, it comes from, we do the work in groups, they bond together in a group, over um, 10 days, over 100 hours. That is, they are face-to-face, -face, in touch with each other, so the, the human attachment, the human attachment is so powerful in the recovery of certain traumas, bring them back into comfort of group. And one of the presentations you're going to be uh, 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 enjoying with uh, Maria and Alejandra is the one about the experience of immigration of immigrants, new Canadians, and refugees. And what we're doing now upon arrival is how do we, how do we respond to them? And hearing Moshi's presentation, let's not wait. Well, yeah, put them in schools, but what kind of services do they deserve around the rehabilitation of what they may carry here? So I'm very excited about their contribution as well. Um, I, I, I did want to just end by saying there probably will be effects of isolation, us all being on cameras, children learning from home, is the drop in their empathy for other human beings. Because how do you learn empathy? You learn empathy by being in a relational contact with others. That was all taken from them. 
And I think we, that's an area of research which is very important that you're saying, post-COVID, what, what happened to all those children that were isolated at home, not only isolated, but they related to a screen for instruction. So we've got lots of things to do. So that, that's my last comment. Pete McMartin wrote a wonderful editorial at about month eight saying he hoped some things like dads taking the kids for walks would stay after the pandemic. So, so my impression is that for some families it's actually been a true joy. They've really enjoyed each other, spent their time together. Um, not tried to shove the kids into a room, not, and limited the screen time. So it's not one size for all. Okay, we have one last question, and I just got a note from Mari. She couldn't hear us. Mari is one of the presentations. Uh, my apologies for that, but uh, we look forward to you presenting, and that's, uh, that will come shortly. Okay, last question, and then we're at... I think the schools are. The teachers, I know a couple of teachers, and they are really anxious to try and sort out who did well and who didn't, and who needs therapy and who doesn't. Yes. Yes. Well, that's, uh, this has been very, very, uh, very, very good, I think, for a start. I mean, it's a bit awkward for us. Uh, we're hybrid, we're trying to do this. But the next uh, one you're invited to attend is October the uh, 19th. Uh, that's, uh, you can look it up and see what the focus is. In fact, I've got it right here. It's the British Home Children, uh, arrival in Canada, and our presenter is here, Professor Grant Charles. So I want to thank uh, the, you, the visitors here, and uh, I know we don't have enough time for more questions, and thank you, Mark, for looking after the setting this up, and thank you, Alan, for the stewardship you've given us. And so that's it. Thank you, Judith, and thank you, Richard. Can you hear me?